Hey all here OS Reviews, over the past year or two, there's been a bit of a resurgence in the popularity of point-and-shoot digital cameras, aka digicams. It's mostly fueled by nostalgia, especially for younger audiences that may not have grown up when these things were still really popular in the early 2000s. And nowadays, the compact camera space has been mostly eaten up by smartphones that can take excellent images when combined with computational photography. That being said, some reasons to consider a dedicated camera might be for the ergonomics. It's a little bit more fun to use with some of those manual controls and shutter keys that you just don't really get from a phone nowadays. But because of the popularity of smartphones, the digicam space, when it comes to main players like Panasonic, Kodak, as well as Nikon, Sony, Canon, so on and so forth, have all mostly exited unless you're looking at slightly more prosumer cameras, such as Sony's RX100 line continues to be a pretty decent choice, but of course those cameras are much more expensive with larger sensors. So out of curiosity, I was looking on Amazon and surprised to find that there are still a couple of newer digital cameras or digicams, that they're all more or less made in China and more generic, but this particular video will be exploring one such example called the C1 that sells for around 40 bucks and actually comes with a 32 gigabyte micro SD card in the box as well. Of course, you really can't expect the same quality of results as you would get from a much more expensive camera. In fact, my expectation is that this will be quite similar in quality to a budget or mid-tier smartphone, but as a novelty toy or a backup for kids to explore, it might be an interesting option. And also one advancement compared to past similarly priced generic cameras is it actually has autofocus now. So believe it or not, many of the past low-cost cameras, which again are more toy-like than anything, didn't even have that. It was a fixed focus lens and that meant it wasn't very good when it comes to getting up close to objects. Now there's also another version that is popular in addition to this one uh, that has a slightly different shell that looks a little bit more fancy. It's in the design of quote-unquote a vlogging camera. Uh, the difference is this one has a slightly larger 3-inch display compared to I believe around 2.7 inches on this particular version. However, the sensor as well as the resolution are all going to be the same. It's just the shell that's a little bit different. And one other slight difference is that this model has built-in Wi-Fi. So similar to a home security camera, you're able to monitor it from afar. If you're slightly further away from a tripod, for example, you can also use it to snap an image. Both of these models can also serve as a webcam if you connect it using the USB cable to a Mac or Windows computer. Both of these cameras, though, are using simple LED flashes as opposed to Xenon that's found on more conventional point-and-shoot cameras that's going to be much brighter. So this is really like a smartphone in that regard. But that being said, one interesting application of this particular unit is it does have a standard 3.5mm headphone jack and comes with a dedicated music player key. So you can actually think of this as an alternative to an MP3 player or a DAP digital audio player if you still want a separate device for loading back music onto the SD card, that is. So I guess it's all about perspective. You could also think of it as a DAP digital MP3 player that happens to have a camera function, kind of similar to the iPod touch and the iPod Nanos of yesteryear that also could serve kind of that double functionality. You can also find some of the self-timer modes as well as the technical resolution here for the JPEGs as well as the video resolution. So again 4K at 30 FPS is going to be the maximum. There's also slow motion capture at 720p. Instead of the packaging, we have just the camera itself along with a lanyard strap. There's also a USB Type-C charging and data sync cable, and there are two rechargeable batteries inside. So you can swap them out with one another if it runs out of juice when you're on the go. It looks very similar to one of those older Nokia phone battery cells. You can get around, I would say, 80 to 100 shots before you have to recharge it again. Now here's a closer look at the camera itself, which I have to say with the slanted text, I think it's trying to imitate some of the Canon point-and-shoot compact cameras of yesteryear, or maybe some of the Nikon designs. So here's a kind of a size comparison next to it. Here is also the Sony RX100, I believe this is the Mark III, but just gives you an idea of the difference there. But of course, the entire shell is constructed out of plastic compared to metal on many of the point-and-shoots of yesteryear, especially the more premium ones. It's not going to be quite as sturdy, but it's not too bad either. It doesn't feel hollow, at least. And the biggest difference of all of these generic cameras, though, compared to real point-and-shoots, is it doesn't really have a true continuous zoom capabilities, unlike the point-and-shoots of 
yesteryear, even the smaller ones tended to have a three times optical zoom, and you're able to zoom freely in and out between that range. For example, two times, 1.7 times, and the entire duration of its zoom is going to be sharp and in focus compared to a digital crop on here. The camera lens doesn't really protrude, it stays in place, just like on smartphones that we have in our pockets. I guess one slight upside is with fewer moving parts, you really can't get dust collected inside, unlike some of these mechanical designs, but again, you are losing out on that zoom capability, it's just not going to be as sharp with a digital crop. Uh, but there it is, at least you do have a higher resolution count, so maybe if you're just zooming in two times, it might still be okay, but anything beyond that, it's definitely going to look a lot more blurry and not as sharp. Now on the bottom we do have thankfully still a standard tripod mount. There's the standard 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and that is again for the audio playback and the music mode. And then there's a door here for the pre-inserted micro SD card as well as one of the batteries. It takes around just an hour to fully charge back up. A lanyard strap, slightly textured plastic, and on the very top we do have a power key along with a two-stage camera shutter key. So again, since this model at least has autofocus, you can gently half press to focus and then press all the way down to capture the image. And then on the other side, there's just a Type-C port for charging, or you can use it in the webcam mode, as well as a loudspeaker. Now on the rear, we have the aforementioned 2.8-inch display, which is not the highest resolution thing in the world, but at the very least, it is a IPS LCD panel. Now the UI is quite simple, we can tell the battery percentage on the top right corner, whether the flash is activated or not, you can also turn on an auto mode, you can tell the number of camera images that you can continue taking in the SD card, as well as the quality of the images that you can tap once here to set, which is corresponding to the level of compression that will be put on top of the image. So this is at the highest mode right now. You can also find different self-timer controls. For some reason, burst mode is described as drama shot. Very dramatic indeed. And further down below, you can find a couple of preset filters to play with, including black and white, negative, there's going to be high saturation, and then there's just a simple white balance and ISO and exposure adjustments that you can play with. So very basic. You don't have the ability to capture in RAW, for example, that might preserve more details if you're editing in Photoshop. You can only capture in JPEG format, so do keep that in mind. And there are no kind of HDR effects, of course, that we've gone used to on our phones because our smartphones have much more advanced processors inside. So pretty much it's just simple snap and go, and that is more or less it. You can zoom in and out using the up and down keys here, but that is all done digitally, as you can tell. So you're going to lose a lot of detail the further in that you go. But there it is. You can also turn on and off composition grid lines there on the side. And afterwards, you can just simply again half press. It takes maybe a split second for it to focus and then capture the image. It is using a CMOS sensor again, just like on any smartphone these days. But that's pretty much par for the course. You can tap on the mode key once to then cycle into other functions, including video recording. It will start off in the 4K 30fps highest resolution possible, and then progress into slightly lower resolution formats, as well as the slow-mo capture. You can then tap again to cycle into a preview of images you've taken, as well as any MP4 files that you have on the SD card. You can view it back on here in addition to JPEG images. That being said, Interestingly enough, you're not able to zoom in and out of the gallery here to see everything at once. I find the lack of a gallery view to be kind of cumbersome, because if you have many files stored on the camera, you have to really cycle through them one at a time, left and right only, instead of being able to control that. Also, you're not able to zoom into any of the images or videos that you capture, so these two buttons are only designed when you're actually framing your shot, you can have that digital crop, but when you're viewing it back, there are no zoom controls of any kind. So some caveats there, but at the very least, it looks like you can again view back these images, and it's decent in terms of uh, giving you a good enough preview of what they look like. Of course, the screen's resolution is not the highest, even though it is an, again, IPS screen, so viewing angles are better than expected, but you can still tell some pixelation, and it becomes actually slightly higher quality when you are viewing it back on a higher res monitor or a laptop. But there we have it, and these are actually some demos that I loaded onto the SD card just to illustrate that you can view it back uh, in terms of acting as a photo slash media player of sorts, but these are the actual photos that the camera has taken, which is to say, with autofocus, at least your images aren't going to be too blurry, but at the same time, it still isn't going to be 
kind of the best quality, especially when it comes to more challenging lighting environments. Outdoors, it seems okay, but there's still a general sense of softness, even on the 4K resolution clips. And when you have more challenging lighting transitions, you can tell that it kind of has more of an abrupt transition. There is no real OIS on board, so everything is digitally stabilized, which is to say, especially in darker environments, it is going to be actually quite difficult to get super sharp looking results unless you put it onto a tripod because the most subtle of shakes will make the image look a lot more blurry. But here we have just a more kind of close-up shot and you can tell that this particular image wouldn't be possible if it didn't have autofocus at the very least. But definitely this is a camera that performs best when it has sufficient lighting around. And again, it's comparable I'd say to the quality that you'll find on a low-end budget smartphone here in 2024, and also there is no accelerometer built into this model, so the screen won't automatically rotate if you're flipping it. Once again, because of the lack of HDR processing, when you are in a more brightly lit environment, some of the finer details in the shadows can get more easily drowned out, so not the best in the world unless you're editing it in post, but that might be a little challenging since all these photos are JPEG at the end of the day. So again, don't expect any miracles. But if you're giving it just to a child, kind of using it as an iPod alternative for music playback, at least the ergonomics are a little bit better than a phone, I would say. Here's also an example of some MP4 video files that I tried loading up on here, and surprisingly, you're able to play it back, scrub between different parts of the clip as well. So as a, again, interesting MP4 player slash MP3 player, that can actually be one application uh, to surprisingly consider this thing, even though the design is going to be quite strange, since it really does resemble a camera here from the front, but again, has that standard headphone jack. There is no Bluetooth though, so no wireless headphones uh, or buds can be connected onto uh, this particular model, but there we have it, just illustrating again some of the video playback capabilities. And if we jump into the music playback mode here at a simple click, uh, you're able to load back, again, MP3 files, and it plays it back just fine. That being said, interestingly enough, FLAC and other formats don't really seem to be recognized. So as a DAP, it's definitely not the strongest when it comes to file format support, unfortunately. That being said, it's very easy to use at the very least, and once you play it back, again, the track you're able to scrub back and forth between, we can crank up the volume. Not the highest resolution or quality speaker in the world, I'd say, but again, you can always plug in your own headphones for slightly better quality playback there. Now, I also mentioned that in the video mode, again, you can change the resolution, as well as whether you want audio to be recorded, yes or no. A loop recording can also be set up, similar to a car dash cam, so if it runs out of space, it will continue to record over the previous files, and you can also go over here to change the time date stamp, as well as whether you want some of these beeping sounds in the system menu to be turned on or off. So here's an example of what happens when we plug it into a computer. You can choose between file transfer, webcam, as well as only for charging. And now this provides us with a larger view of what the photos look like, so we can actually zoom in and crop a little bit more easily on a monitor. Again, when there's sufficient lighting, it might be still okay, but of course, the closer in that you get, you can tell that it just becomes a bit more blurry, not quite as sharp, and differences in contrast are going to be hard for this camera to handle without a more sophisticated processing algorithm on board. But again, this serves as an example of what you can expect. So there we have it, a look at what a new point-and-shoot compact camera performs like, especially in the sub $50 budget range here in 2024. And at the end of the day, it's all about perspective, I guess, and who this is intended for. Again, as a toy or novelty for a child, I would say it's all right. Uh, you can also, again, consider it as a webcam with a built-in tripod or as a music player. Funny enough, that being said, if you are primarily evaluating the photo quality and that's your number one criteria, then just know it's not going to be the highest quality thing in the world. Yes, it has autofocus, which is at least better than not having it in prior models, and it's technically using a smartphone-like sensor inside, but again, if you have a slightly higher quality phone with better software processing, that can likely already get you better looking results. In addition, it might be still worth considering an actual point-and-shoot camera of yesteryear if you're going after ergonomics and you want better looking shots. For example, I would recommend the Panasonic Lumex LX series, and this is actually 
similar to a rebranded Leica Deluxe series cameras, so it captures beautiful looking results. The resolution count is actually lower at only around 8 megapixels here, but the lens is extremely bright and you end up with more satisfying looking results, again with a true continuous optical zoom built in as well versus just a digital crop. So just consider this mostly as kind of a fun novelty item more than anything, or again for perhaps a child, for backup purposes, at least it is having a few improvements here and there. You can learn more details if interested in the links down below. Again, not to be taken super seriously, but giving you an idea of what you can expect out of kind of a 2024 model. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews.